This is a global tail link prepaid call from Tarek McBall. An inmate at the New Jersey State Prison. This call will be monitored and recorded. Hello, and welcome back to One Minute Remaining. My name is Jack Lawrence, the host and creator of this show. Today is part nine of the story of the man who's been incarcerated for over 20 years, originally tried for the death penalty for a 2002 double homicide of Jung Amuni Ahn, Tarek Makbul. So before we get into today's episode, I want to share something with you. It's something I wasn't sure if I was going to put in to the show or not. Uh, number one, I, I don't want anyone to be swayed by my thoughts and feelings. Um, you know, there's a hell of, hell of a lot of audio and conversations that I have with the men and women that I speak with that don't make it onto the podcast because they're just general conversations about life and, and feelings and, you know, some just private conversations. I don't believe that everything needs to be shared all the time. But I was asked the other day about something and it's a question I've got before uh, in our OMR Facebook group and it's about how I cope mentally day after day speaking with people who are in prison some of whom we believe have been wrongfully incarcerated, you know, even those who have done the wrong thing but have been punished so utterly severely uh, for seemingly minor crimes, especially non-violent crimes. And it was quite well-timed, the question actually, because I was feeling on a particular day quite fed up um, and in fact Tarek rang me that day and the first words out of his mouth to me were, how are you buddy? You sound exhausted. Then I did proceed to go on a bit of a rant uh, about how I was feeling and Tarek and I had a conversation and this is what followed. One of the biggest questions I get asked a lot is, um, actually I even got asked it the other day, is like I I don't understand, how how do you you cope listening to these stories day in, day out, um, you know, and the frustration and how how do you keep doing it? And my answer was mm. my answer was simple: was I get to switch off at the end of the night. I might, maybe not mentally, but you know, I, I, I walk mm. out of this room and you know I have the kids there and I have my wife and and my house mm. and my life and you know, so I get the opportunity to switch off. Whereas the people I mm. speak with, they live it every single day. You know, they go to sleep at night, they wake up with their eyes open, and they go, F- "Wasn't a bad dream," you know. Um, <laughs> And I just say, like, nothing mentally for me could ever get to the point where I would turn around and go, I just can't do this anymore. And, you know, I, I fell into this mm. by accident. You know, I, I thought I was going to be putting together a show. I used to enjoy watching prison documentaries and stuff like that. And I'll be honest, it was because I mm. found it fascinating about the, the shankings and all that sort of stuff. You know, the, mm. the stuff mm. that those, the reason those shows do so well is because people's fascination with this mm. world that they'll never experience. So I thought I was going to put out mm. this show with those fascinating stories, hear cool stories about gangs in prison and all that bullshit. And then mm. my, my mind was just completely opened to reality and speaking to people who are in prison like yourself and like all the other people I speak to, people just like me, Mm. people just like my friends, people just like my family, normal human beings, you know, it's just completely opened my mind to the actual reality of it all, that this isn't f***ing entertainment. Mm. This isn't just about cool stories. This is real life. This is real stuff that's going on to people in the world. And where I get my frustration and anger from now is helpless i feel helpless i feel utterly mm-hmm. like well, after we got off the phone just a minute ago i was wandering around the house in a bit of a daze just going how can i i there must be like i'm banging my head and you, you know you i'm sort of venting to you and you, it's your situation <laughs> but i'm like hitting my head on a mm-hmm. wall going i i just who will who will listen to this and who will help someone must list like i'm reading these statements going these need to be read by someone who can actually make a difference who can actually look at this and go, this is crazy. This man is in prison based on this bullshit. Are you kidding me? And I feel feel bad (laughs) venting to you about this when you're the one sitting in that f***ing hellhole. It's it's perfectly fine. Listen to me. You're doing something, I I said this to you before, it's something noble. So trust me, if anyone I can hear this from is you, I, I get 
over the years, I feel like in one of the writings I shared that, you know, I just like a piece of twig that, you know, in the winter it's got too close to the bank and got frozen in and the middle of the river keeps flowing, right? And to me, it's like, it's like life. Like I'm stuck in place. My time stopped the day I entered the prison system. From that point on, every point of reference that I know is from 2002, you know, yeah, yeah. I can tell you about clubs or restaurants or whatever. Uh, we can talk about girls or beaches or whatever. It's, it's all going to go back to that, that time. And, but I see my family, I see my friends struggle and struggle with the same thing that you are now. And over the years, some out of just frustration, they just, uh, you know, I lose contact with them. Some people just move on, you know, because they prioritize you out of their life. Yeah. Some people, it's um, actually opposite. They actually are so frustrated that you, they just don't know what to do. And then they don't want to face you because they feel ashamed about it. I think it's all about, bro, it's it's about just putting everything in perspective in a way that what happened, happened in the past is past. Or what is in the future is not in our control, what we can't really focus on. And I used to hear a lot of um, people who do coaching and stuff say this all the time, stay in the present. I think coming into prison, I kind of understood that, uh, that, you know, that saying or that advice. All you can do is put one foot after the other. I, I know at the end, and I'm, I'm mature enough to know that it might all be for naught, but I don't want to be that person that's sitting here in prison after, God forbid, so many years and looking back and say, I didn't try. So I think that in it, there is solace. And I think what you're doing, don't think about the ultimate goal of helping. It's just the fact that you have taken an initiative, you know, this initiative. And so my friend, what I'm trying to very badly try to explain to you that what you're doing means much more than you can even fathom. It's, it's hope, okay? And to give somebody hope, it's a divine thing to do. So I really want you to understand whether it's fruitful or not. I know Jack Lawrence and, you know, Australia and Tarek here and New Jersey State Prison try to do something that hopefully might help the next Tarek and hopefully make the next Jack even more successful. So that's what it's all about, man. So today we are in court and we are looking at the testimony of Jawad Mir, or Jay. His testimony, as we now know, is the only one of the three that we can look at because come trial time, the other two witnesses had run. Andy had fled back to India and Zaid across the border to Canada. Not only was Jay's the only testimony that would make it into court, but also the only original statement as the judge would not allow Andy or Zaid's statements to be bring into court because of the fact they would not be attending the trial. Did you attend sort of every day of his trial or, or a lot of his trial? I did. I did. Tarek's brother, Eddie. I mean, that Every is, single day. Did, did you, were you ever called to the stand to testify? I was not. I was not. Um, the, his attorney refused to bring me on. She said, you are way too emotional right now and you're too hot-headed and you're going to say something that the jury is not going to like. And I kept telling her that there's no one that knows him better than me. There's no one that knows this situation. Aside from the deal and the murders, like I know all these guys involved use me for something. As I've previously mentioned, I have been given access to a ton of transcripts, which includes Jay's complete testimony at trial, which I have read in full. However, of course, to bring you the entire thing would be ludicrous. So much like with the statements, I will focus on what I believe are the major issues between his testimony at trial and his original statement to police. Please rise, court is now in session. So, of course, there's a lot of information about this so-called deal, although there's a lot less information and a lot less detail in his testimony than in his original statement. But we are going to skip past all of that because it can only confuse us even more. And we're going to go directly to essentially what Tarek is on trial for, the murder of two men. 
So we'll look at the moment they all arrive at the store for this apparent deal. Now, in the original statement, Jay would say that Tariq was not happy that the nephew, Mooney, was in the car outside. He says that he could have a gun, so he wants him inside. And Jay goes out to watch the money. He's asked if Tariq was okay with this. And he says that he was arguing about it, but eventually says, okay, fine. Come trial time, at this point, he again says that Tariq wanted everyone in the room in order to make the deal. The entire section about his concern regarding a possible gun has now gone, and he just says that he wants everyone in the room. And he says that everyone in the room eventually comes to the conclusion that Jay should be the one to go outside and watch the money. Tarek's attorney would question Jay on this come time for cross-examination, asking that if Tarek was so insistent that everyone was in the room when this deal happened, why was it that he was sent out when Tarek was, in his own words, demanding everyone be inside? Jay says that they are old friends. He knew Tariq, he knew Andy, and he now knew Jung. He wasn't the main guy in the deal, and everyone kind of trusted him, so they sent him out to watch the money. Tariq's attorney then begins to ask him just how many times he'd in fact met Jung. Just twice prior to the night of the deal, he says. And when had he met the nephew? Well, he'd never met him before. Tariq's attorney says... So you've known him two days and you're outside watching his money? Yes, he replies. You'd never met Jung before other than now? No, never. Never done business with him? No, never. So Jay goes outside. Now in his original statement to police just a couple of days after this crime had occurred, He says he was outside for five minutes when he gets curious as to what's going on and he knocks on the door. Zaid opens the door and he gets lost in his smile and then someone pushes him in. Come trial time, he's asked again how long he was outside for, but this time 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes. Now, this is a recurring theme during his testimony. He's extremely vague about details and in fact there is continuous objections from Tarek's attorney about his lack of commitment to any particular detail, who said what, who was where. The prosecution are continually warned, as is he, about this and that he must be specific. In fact, the judge at one point saying, I have already cautioned you on that, sir. These responses are essentially meaningless and they also make my ruling difficult because I'm not sure who he's referring to making comments. He needs to be specific. When he said they, who's they? They tied us up on the floor. Who's us? He pulled a gun on us. Well, was it a machine gun? Howitzer? Cannon? What are we talking about? We need to be specific in his responses. Come cross-examination, Tarek's attorney again questions him on this account of Zaid pushing him inside. In fact, you told the police that Zaidi opened the door, he smiles and says hello, and you were lost in his smile before he pushes you in the door. Is that what you told them? I don't remember. Well, is it fair to say that this event is the most horrific event of your life? That is correct. So it's something that is going to stay with you forever. Is that right? That's right. Yet I was there for the whole uh, trial. Shamila, Tarek's cousin. And uh, I think... When I first saw him stand up from his desk and being handcuffed, his mother and I could could feel ourselves just falling to the ground. Just seeing him just in handcuffs was enough for us to not not keep our control. It was just, you know, he already was putting his hands behind him. I can't explain, Jack, because when you live with somebody who's like Tarek, and then you see everything taken from them. 
and and you're helpless. So again, going to Jay's original statement to police, he talks about this moment where Andy freaks out. He jumps up, he's, he runs into the bathroom and he apparently tries to escape through the ceiling. He then slips uh, and then he's grabbed and beaten by one of the African-American guys. Come trial time, when he's speaking to the prosecutor, it, he again speaks of this moment that Andy tries to escape. He says that Andy's running all around the room. He's, he's trying to find an escape as one of the African-American guys was ch- also chasing him and hitting him. And eventually Andy goes into the bathroom he says he saw him from there, where he was, go into the bathroom and close the door. During the defence cross-examination, Tarek's attorney displays photographs of the back room where this robbery and murder was alleged to have taken place. She, in fact, asks Jay to come down from the stand to show her where everyone was positioned, to which he actually asks, do I have to? Yes, the judge replies. So he begins to explain where everyone is, bodies laying all over the floor in this back office. And Tarek's attorney starts asking about this apparent moment that Andy breaks free to run around the room. You're lying here, June is lying here, Moni is here, and Andy is running around this room? Yes. He never gets out of this room, correct? No. He's running around this room with one of the black males chasing him. That's right. So they're jumping over bodies as they're running around the room? That's correct. Andy manages to run into the bathroom, is that correct? That's right. Now is the door open or closed? When he gets in the bathroom, the door gets closed. Does he close it? He closes it himself. He's asked if he could see what was going on the whole time. And he says, no, not the whole time as he's covering, he's hiding his face and occasionally sort of peeking to see. They then begin a lengthy back and forth about how Jay is tied up. With what, and who was tied, and where they were tied. He gives some detail, but again, he spends a lot of time saying he doesn't remember or isn't sure. He does state that his wrists are bound behind his back and his feet are tied at the ankles. He's lying flat on his stomach on the floor. He's asked, When were you tied up? As soon as I was made to get on the floor. So you're tied up before Andy gets up to run around? Yes. Now he's asked to show the court, to demonstrate how he's in fact tied up, showing the jury his hands behind his back, where on his ankles he'd been taped. So it's fair to say you couldn't move? Yes. Now, the interesting thing is, and remember this moment, because he's asked how long they were tied for and at what point they were untied. And he says... Once they had arrived at the motel, this is at the very end of everything, they were at the motel, he says that is where they are untied. So you're laying on the floor in the back of the store, you're tied, mouths covered. Yes. And you testified a few minutes ago that you weren't able to see everything because you were peeking through your hands. Now, how is that possible? You just showed your wrists and arms behind your back. What were you peeking through? Uh, at some point, they tied us up. When we, were, when we entered, I mean, they didn't tie us right away. Okay, so are you tied up when Andy is running around the room or not? I don't remember. They were attacking him, but at the same time, it just, it became like, you know, remember at the time of the trial, no one else came. Andy had gone, uh, but Reed Brothers were not testifying. Zaid was not available anymore. So all the statements that culminated to get me to, you know, to get indicted and everything, none of them showed up. So it actually helped the prosecution because it was only Jay and it was only his statement. So his inconsistency were considerably, like, you know, lowered in that sense because now we don't have other people's accounts about the same damn thing. It's just his two uh, inconsistency where he had testified at the Reed Brothers trials and then his original statement. So one of the other biggest issues, maybe the biggest issue with this testimony at trial and his original statement was an apparent use of a plastic bag. What amazes me is this shopping bag suddenly comes into into play. Um, 
Mm-hmm. You know, no one ever mentioned a shopping bag. There was no mention by anybody in any statement about a shopping bag. And all of a sudden, he's now on trial. Mm-hmm. He's at, at trial, you know, answering questions, and he and he comes out with his apparent. You first of all, you tried to kill this guy with a shopping bag. Yeah, I thought there was a reason for it. I think. Now, at no point during his statement to police originally, just a couple of days after this crime, does he ever mention anything regarding a plastic bag. However, come trial time, he tells the court that initially Tariq produces a plastic bag and places it over Jung's head in an attempt to suffocate him. It goes on for about a minute or so until Tariq apparently gives up and takes out a wire from a board, like an advertising board, and begins to strangle him. He talks of Jung's legs beating against his even saying that it was like slaughtering an animal, really painting this awful picture. And again, of course, come cross-examination, Tarek's attorney is straight in there, asking him about this whole bag situation. And in fact, on his account of Jung's legs beating against his. Because remember, she's asked him to show the court on a photo where everyone was placed in that room. His legs are beating on your legs? Yes. You're across the room from him? Yes. How are his legs beating on yours? He's across the room. Uh, Because he's struggling. It was so intense that I can't explain it. But it was so intense that he pushed himself here and there. uh, And there was a point which he came right towards me. Like his legs were towards me. uh, Then his legs were beating against mine. And he was just suffering, crying for his life. Like, please let me go. And he managed to struggle, according to you, all the way across the room. Yes. To get to the point that his legs are beating against yours. Yes. But his ankles are tied. Yes. And his wrists are tied. Yes. Tarek's attorney then draws his attention to the plastic bag and the fact that it was never mentioned in his original statement. She says, You never told the police about the bag, did you? I don't remember. In fact, it wasn't until March 24th, 2004 that you mentioned anything about a plastic bag. Why didn't you tell them? I probably forgot. Forgot? Well, you seem pretty shaken by it today, and you forgot to tell the police about it just days later? There were so many things going on in my mind. I I, I had just come out of a horrific scene. Now, I know Tarek's attorney may have failed in her job to bring potential witnesses. Obviously, we've heard that from Tarek and his brother, and it seems like an odd decision to make. But what I can't fault her on is her ruthless cross-examination of Jay. She really does give him a hard time on his discrepancies, especially from his original statement. I just don't understand the reason, because they they seem to do a really great job in certain certain points. As I said, they really seem to... Cross-examination. Cross-examination seems to be quite good. But So so it's just like, why, why not? You know, you, you were doing such a great do- job. See, why, why not bring people on the stand to help? I, I just did not understand that. And, and I think at the end of the day, they didn't have to, I can even look at it. I Honestly, I, I'm still jaded about the fact that I didn't force myself when I was, if I'm, if I was older, maybe I was young, so I just literally trusted them. But I still believe that even if they didn't want to put me on the stand, they could have at least called Kenny, could have called Sam, because that went to the heart of the entire case. Because Jay did not talk about Kenny. He did not talk about Sam. He did not talk about any of those things. And had you brought those guys, then you realize this is not what you think it is. This was a legit deal for me. It was I tried to literally make it happen. And the premise of the whole case was just set them up, set them up, set them up, and get this. It was not true at all. So I don't know. Uh, really, all I can tell you is what they told me at the end. I mean, she told me specifically. She said, we have this one. Uh, I'm not calling it. We don't need to call anyone. She would also question him with my personal favourite part of the account of Jung apparently asking for this glass of water as he was being strangled. After the plastic bag, before the wire, at what point does Jung get a glass of water? I don't remember. Well, yesterday you told us it was after the plastic bag. I don't remember that. You don't remember that? How do you remember the drink if you don't remember when? Uh, At some point he screamed water because of his resistance was so intense. I I imagine he got out of the tape that was across his mouth and he just said water. But there's a bag over his head. 
He's resisting and saying, water, water. As I say, I don't remember at what point he said water. And Tarek gets him water. Yes. How does he drink it? He's tied up on the floor on his stomach. Well, I didn't see him drink it. I I could just hear it. You have exceptional hearing. You hear a lot of things, don't you, sir? So she continues on, making him take her back through his apparent recollection of that evening. She talks about how they're moved. Are they still bound when they're moved? I don't remember. Were you dragged or picked up? I don't remember. Who put you in the car? I don't remember. And this goes on and on and on. And then we see just how bad Jay's memory apparently is when they're discussing being driven around. And he's asked, Now you're still bound. Is that right? Uh, I don't remember at what point they released our hands and legs. But yes, at some point we were bound. What about when you're being transported and placed in another car? Uh, I don't remember that. You don't remember. You told me earlier that you remember being untied at the motel. Is that accurate? I did not say untied at the motel. I said I was free at the motel. There are two different things. Luckily, we have the trial transcripts, so we can check out exactly what he said just a few pages ago. In fact, page 65 of the testimony. Does there ever come a point in time where the tape is removed from your wrists and ankles? Yes. When is that? I believe somewhere in the motel. So at this point, they break for lunch, and upon their return, Tarek's attorney is not about to let Jay off with his lack of memory regarding being tied up. She reads back what he had said previously to her about the motel and asks if he was walking around the motel or was he bound? I don't remember. Were you walking in the motel? I don't remember. Were you tied? I don't remember. So they were attacking him on a lot of things, uh, but, you know, it's it, like I said... It's not all in a false examination. I thought they did a pretty decent job uh, because at the end he just, because he got so confused, he just shut up. And he, uh, in the last, I think, few minutes of his testimony, or he kept on just saying, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't know, I don't remember. She then takes him back to when he says they are taken from the shop to the cars. When you're leaving the store, everything is over. You're being dragged to the car, as you said this morning. Yes. You testified you were still bound hands and wrists, correct? I don't remember. You don't remember what you testified to three hours ago? Well, when we were escorted to the car, yes, we were tied at that point. Okay. So how did you get to the car if you're tied up? I don't remember. Were you hopping? I don't remember. She then asks him about testimony he had given on May 27th of 2004, when he was questioned by the prosecution. She says... May 27th, 2004, page 10, line 24. Question. You say your hands are still bound, but they cut your feet so you can walk out. Answer. Yes. May 26th, 2004, page 91, line 14, again under oath. Question. Who pulled you out of the store? Answer. They basically told us to go out where the car was and told us to go into the car. Question. Were you bound when you left the store? Answer. Yes, our hands, but they untied our legs at that moment. So which is accurate, sir? Oh, I don't remember exactly. Whatever I gave in my first statement to detectives, that's accurate because that was right after the incident. So this isn't accurate? What's in the 2004 transcripts? I'm not saying it isn't accurate. I just don't remember. I don't remember exactly how we came out of the store. But you're under oath. You're committed to tell the truth, but on these particular days, what you said, you're uncertain whether or not it's correct? Whatever I said at that point was a guess. And how much of today's testimony are you guessing? Now, the other thing that confused me about this whole entire situation was the discussion of the severe beating that they apparently went through. Both Andy and Jay now saying that they were beaten for 15 to 20 minutes. And I, of course, asked Tarek if at any point these guys were examined for injuries. Andy and Jay talking about being beaten up. Andy really lays it on thick that he was he was properly bashed, like, big time. Uh, even choked at one point. Yeah. There's, was, there's, was there any ever any injuries yeah, found yeah, on these guys? Like, any medical reports done? No, they have, they, they, no, they, no, nothing. His attorney also focused in on this at one point. Where did they kick you? Everywhere, all over my body. How were they kicking you? Like a football. Like a football. So that's a pretty hard kick, right? Yes. When did you see a doctor? I did not. 
When did you go to hospital? I did not. When did you receive x-rays to check for any injuries? I didn't need one. No, and you didn't need to see a doctor, did you, sir? No. As Jay's grilling continues about that night, he just continues to answer almost every single question with the same response. I don't remember. How long were you driving for? I don't remember. Were you carried into the motel? I don't remember. Who was in the motel? I I don't remember. Was Andy in there? I don't remember. At some point you went from one room to another, correct? Yes. How did you get there? Were you carried? Did you walk? I don't remember. Now what I noticed from the questions that were asked of him by the prosecution, you notice that Jay at no point says, I don't remember. In fact, he answers basically every single question that's asked of him. There's no I don't remember responses, yet it was almost his sole response to Tarek's attorney. Seemingly, he'd been caught out a few times, even changing his answers from the previous day, and decided the best option was the I don't remember response. It kind of doesn't show like on the paper how it comes out, but in the courtroom it was very, very quiet. Like even the jury was just like, this, what the heck is happening? And he just literally just basically threw the flag in. Um, so yeah, I think they hit him pretty hard on the inconsistencies, uh, but he was adamant, so. You have one minute remaining. And that's all we've got time for. Coming up, medical experts hit the stands. It would be one of the only people that the defence did bring to bolster their case that Tarek Makbul did not kill Jung or Muni Ahn. But of course, the prosecution bring their own expert, an expert who in fact had been struck off. And not only that, but we found someone. Someone highly involved in this case. In fact, the state's key witness. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hello. Hey, mate. How's everything? Uh, yeah, mate, fine. Absolutely fine, you know, just uh, continuing to... Uh, do you, obviously, we we've, we've found Jay. Next time on One Minute Remaining. One Minute Remaining is a Mashed Pumpkin production created, hosted and produced by Jack Lawrence with thanks to special guest producer Alyssa Cook. Audio and sound design by Jack Lawrence and Dom Evans of Earsay. <laughs>